Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in once again. Uh, today, we're going to be uh, focusing on the uh, ancient mound builders, uh, in particular, mainly in the Mississippi Valley. We will be taking a look at a lot of artifacts, uh, like vases and the symbols in these vases, and how they resemble ancient Egypt. We will also talk about the Davenport tablets that they found in these mounds but before we begin just so we can have people uh, come make sure enough people make it to this live premiere we're going to be uh, looking at uh, the gallery here at the Birmingham Museum of Art okay and uh, it's the lost realms of the mound builders ancient Native Americans of the South and Midwest right this is uh, alright so this is a pretty cool uh virtual uh, gallery tour here we're gonna be looking at these artifacts hope you guys enjoy this <laughs> so let's start all right as you guys can see look at this i figure out how to use it so we can be able to zoom in look at the designs on this look at that wow and you can look at these uh statuettes cool I mean, a lot of these look like they got like helmets on and stuff or, or like a turban on. All right. Warrior FG pipes. Some more bases here. Or it says here, human leg vessel with modern repair to foot. Mississippian culture, Arkansas. Look at this. This is a cove with inscribed long bone and, and skull motive. Says. These are hard to see from the front because the lights are reflecting from the window, but you guys can see. Uh, this was found again in the mounds. And uh, these are some more things found in the mounds, as you guys can see. Look at all this high civilized art and culture and all these things they had. Effigy bottle says. Look at this mess right here. All right. Wow. <laughs> and look at the right here, the drawings in the back. Look at that. He got dressed up like a Jaguar. They almost look like the Aztec and the Mayas, right? Human effigy face with deer antlers. And we got these vases right here. Engraved shell corrugate with human head effigies. From Oklahoma, spiral. And we got an effigy pipe of a seated male figure from Oklahoma. And this is the other side, the one on the other side. Look at that. Earth Mother Effigy Pipe, the Floor County, Oklahoma spiral site. It says Earth Mother is a supernatural entity connected to rebirth, is associated with fertility and corn. Corn is one aspect of her earthly manifestation this is just like the video we were talking about yesterday right the corn mother more artifacts here as you guys can see beautiful all right this was all found in the mounds all right serving pot look at this So this is some supposed clothing, right? <laughs> Check out the fringes though. All right, even, and all this is found in the mounds, all right? This is a big one right here. They don't have it centered for some reason, <laughs> but you can see just like in the Hindu culture, right? With the eye and the hand, look at that. They found that in the mounds. Look at this, embossed human head effigy plate. And it says repose plate of human hand with eye motive. Look at that. This is again from the mound builders culture. And some more bases here, more art. So you guys can see like the art on the bases, pretty cool. And some more over here. All right, you see the two hands over here. They got the cross in the hand, look at that. Then we got some uh, people, some legs, hands, and stuff like here. So of course, it's broken, probably. 
engraved shell cup with human effigy images drawn in relief, engraved shell gorget, and an engraved shell gorget of human hands. All right, so I hope uh, you guys enjoyed this little virtual uh, tour. And we'll leave it with this, I guess, beaded necklace. All right, a beaded necklace. All right, let's get started with the video. We're in this book right now. It's called Records of Ancient Races. In the Mississippi Valley, being an account of some of the pictographs, sculptured hieroglyphics, symbolic devices, emblems, and traditions of the prehistoric races of America, with some suggestions as to their origin by William McAdams. This is from 1887, Record of the Ancient Races of the uh, Mississippi Valley. Right? Cover right here. And we're on page 53. This is chapter 13. It says here, the water vessels always accompanying the food vessels in the mounds are very peculiar. And some of the types have a strong resemblance to the water vessels of Egypt. The following is a common form and hundreds of this shape are to be seen among the collections of mound pottery from the Valley of the Mississippi. These are of a capacity to hold from one pint to four or five quarts of liquid. It is quite easy to see that from making useful vessels, it would be natural to advance to the ornamental. Yet it is a little singular that ornamentation is almost very every particular of the American Mount Pottery should be so exactly like that of Egypt and the East, just like Egypt, exactly like Egypt, where's the real Egypt? The owl-headed vase in the illustration of the following page is almost exactly like one figured by Shaluman from Troy in reference to the superiority of the skill displayed by the mound builders in the ceramic arts to the corresponding efforts of ancient Europe we cannot do better than quote the words of Dr. Foster in the plastic arts the mound builders attain a perfection far in advance of any samples which have been found characteristic of the stone or even the bronze age of Europe all right it, it doesn't compare we can readily conceive that in the advance of any metallic vessels, pottery would be employed as a substitute, and the potter's art would be held in the highest esteem. From useful forms, they advance to ornamental. Sir John Lubbock remarks that few of the British sepulchral urns belonging to anti-Roman times have any curved lines. Representations of animals and plants are almost entirely wanton. They are even absent from all the articles belonging to the Bronze Age in Switzerland and I might say in Western Europe generally. But they were common in Greece and Egypt and East and also in the Mississippi Valley. We believe it would hardly be impossible in all Europe to get together as fine a collection of implements of Stone Age as we have made in the Mississippi Valley. It doesn't compare to the Stone Age over there in Europe. Nor do we believe there is a collection of pottery of Stone Age of Europe that can view with ours of the Mississippi valley of the same age this valley had even a superior polished stone age not only in objects made of granite and other primary rocks but of polished flint or dirt and some of the most beautiful objects of the stone age in the mississippi valley are those of white shirt or flint in the which the marks of the chipping are completely ground off and the surface is smooth and polished axes and celts of this kind in our collection are far superior to any shown in Evans stone implements of Great Britain and if our stone implements are superior all right then listen to what they're telling you our mount powder and artistic design is certainly above of Europe during the same age so all this pottery and stone axe is the the technique the science behind it the the art the skill to make them is so much different it's so much superior than all of that in Europe and even Egypt. This is the chapter 14 and it says here pictographs and hieroglyphic inscriptions on the pottery. And it's going to mention about the cross symbol. It says here the mound builder's religion and belief in afterlife. Remember Grand Hancock? We're going to get that. Uh, he's going to remind us that they had the exact same belief just like the Egyptians. And it says here, the figure of the cross on the vessel, the cross of the Egyptians, the cross of the Chinese, all right? And here's an example 
from Mount on the Illinois. This one right here with the cross and the circle. We're going to see that where that also exists. It actually sits in the hieroglyphic of the name of Egypt. Yes, in the Egyptian hieroglyphic, that same, same symbol. We start right here. It says in Europe, where it is ancient and common, perhaps it would be called a Greek cross. But the same figure is seen on the pyramids and was a hieroglyph in Egypt some thousands of years ago. We're talking about that cross symbol. In fact, according to Wilkinson, a figure almost exactly like the enclosed cross on this burial vase from a mound on the Illinois River makes a part of the hieroglyphic name of Egypt. You hear that? A glyph, an enclosed cross. This is found on a pottery and from a mound in the Illinois River. Part of the hieroglyphic name of Egypt is on that in Illinois, in which it is repeated four times. And that says that's from Sir Gardner Wilkes and Ancient Egyptians. And we got that book right here. That's the Ancient Egyptians by Sir Gardner uh, Wilkinson from 1854. And we're on page 244 where it's said to go. And down here says the name of Egypt. You see the X and you see the symbol of the cross and the X crossed in the circle. Ow. We heard about the Ow earlier. Continuing the book, it says, and the same reliable author, and speaking of sacred cakes of the ancient Egyptians, with which the sacred bulls consecrated to the service of their god Isis, Isin, we'll see Queen Mu Isin, Isis, little sister, is that what it means? Were fed, and upon which there was made the same sign of the cross. Says the cross cakes was their hieroglyphic for civilized land. That's what that cross, you see that? In the circle, he's saying in Egyptian meaning, it meant that was a symbol or the hieroglyph for civilized land. Wherever you saw this, that meant civilized land. So we know it was we were very civilized here with the mound societies, the mound builders, very civilized. The same figure of divided circle, however, occurs in the alphabet or figurative writing of the Chinese and has a similar significance being their emblem for land or country. The explanation was given to me by most intelligent and educated Chinaman that the cross in the circle had the simple meaning among his people of partition, signifying that their land was divided into fields. In other words, not wild, but a civilized country. You see, agriculture, fields, corn. The figure of an enclosed cross occurs many times in the valley of the Mississippi. This figure is what found all over the Mississippi and pottery in the mounds all over in the walls. What does that mean? Civilized country, a civilized place. And we have seen it on the pottery, not only outlined by incision, but painted thereon in the peculiar mineral colors used by the mound builders. It is also seen in the carvings on the bluffs and in the caverns, as well as among the painted pictographs. It's all over the Americas and around the Mississippi. It occurs also inscribed on the ornaments of shell and other material used by this ancient people. And in a few instances, we have seen the same symbol on their implements of stone. And we're in chapter 15 real quick. I just want to show you this vase here. Ethan vessel with inscription in colored clay. This is from the Mississippi Valley. All right, the mound builders. You see the civilized country symbol. You see the symbol right here. We're going to see that's the name of Egypt. We just caught it in the other book. We're going to get it a little bit later again. Tamari. Tamari has this symbol right here. And they're talking about that these ornaments must have a greater significance, a greater meaning other than just a little color, you know. So it explains a little bit here. This is the other symbols we see here. Found all over the vases in the Mississippi Valley. There's another example right here. Vase from Mount in Missouri and a vase from a tomb in Thebes in Egypt. All right? It says here, Shiliman dug up from the site of Ilium on the Trojan Plain innumerable relics bearing such symbols. And Sir Gardner Wilkinson found them everywhere in ancient Egypt. All right, these same symbols that you find in here in Missouri. You see that? And it says the figure on the right is taken from Wilkinson's ancient Egyptians and was recovered from a tomb amid the ruins of ancient Thebes in Egypt. That we have taken scores of burial vases from the ancient mounds of Illinois and Missouri, almost exactly duplicating the most peculiar shapes of many from Egypt. Duplicates? 
which one is the real one which one is the duplicate again when the french were here right supposedly french were the first ones to go into egypt revive egypt and all that ancient egypt where were they really they were here in louisiana weren't they louisiana purchase mississippi all that all right where were the french where were they really finding all these relics and stuff they got in these museums today are they really from egypt if they're so identical who's going to be able to tell where it came from is my point right they're telling you right here duplicating many from egypt would it in itself be remarkable but that many of these should be ornamented in the same peculiar way and bear the same symbolic inscriptions is at least suggest suggestive all right not only are they made the same way but they have the same ornaments as in ancient egypt so they those really come from ancient egypt or they just grabbing them from the mississippi and put them in the museums for the age of the vase from the mound in missouri we have as yet perhaps no data but for the theban vase we go back in the history of the past among the temples tombs and pyramids full three thousand years perhaps more for it was nearly that long ago doubtless when homer wrote the, his iliad where he makes Achilles exclaim, Not thou you were to offer me the wealth of Egyptian thieves with his hundred gates. Yet according to Shiliman, Homer's knowledge of heroic Troy was only traditional. Our mound vase may not be as old as the Egyptian one, nor is it necessary that the maker should be contemporary in point of time. He doesn't know the age. He admitted they don't know. They don't have no data on how old the one, but he's willing to say that it's not as old as the Egyptian one. But we already know that's the hijack, right? We know was the true old world. We're in chapter 16. Just want to read a little bit here, talking about another vase. So we have another pretty burial vase or water vessel from a mound on the line between Southeast Missouri and Arkansas. It is a little larger than somewhat similar shaped vessel figured on the preceding page. All right, so they were going to talk about this image right here. And also remember the cross symbol we saw earlier. But that to which we would more especially call the attention of our readers is the row of symbolic designs about the base of the neck of the vessel. They are six in number, following consecutively as above. The last figure T, however, is repeated several times on the vessel. This T, or Tau, as the Egyptians called it, was a sign of life on all their ancient monuments. Several of these figures are common on the great obelisk from Egypt, recently set up in New York. They have a great resemblance also to Chinese characters. It is well known to Chinese scholars that many characters, which this is a vase right here with the symbols, originally were of circular form, were laterally made square, the better to manipulate them on the introduction of a type. And the Chinese now in writing the old style make some figures round which in the type are square. It was a custom of the ancient Egyptians to place on the breast of their mummies a sort of amulet or sacred object. One of the most common of these, according to Wilkinson, was a scarabos or a sacred beetle, all right? This was carved from a great variety of hard stones such as agate, amethyst, and even the most precious of gems. Every one of these beetles bore on its back the sacred tau or tea, all right? So that beetle in Egypt he's talking about, they had on their back the symbol of the cross or the T, right? This is significant. Remember that. The Egyptian symbol of life. That's the Egyptian symbol of life. The lines of separation of the wing covers the beetle naturally formed this sign on its back. But in many of the beautiful scarabi, we have been seen the tile or cross is dominant either by insist lines or by being raised in relief. These scarabi are so common about the mummy pits of Egypt that hundreds are sometimes collected, made of great varieties of stone, each insect bearing on his back the sacred cross. It is very singular that the mound builders of the Mississippi Valley should have had a custom quite similar. All right, listen to this. So in Egypt, they did that. Now in the Mississippi, right in the real uh, Great River, the real Nile, Great River, it is common in the mounds, especially those in the American bottom, as well as in Missouri, Arkansas, and Tennessee, to find on the breast of the skeleton a circular disc or gorget of a seashell. Listen to this. This shell disc generally has carved upon it 
some symbolic sign. And we have found new, a number of them on which was carved an insect, generally a spider. But what is most singular is that the back of the insect invariably bears the symbol of the cross, just like the beetle in Egypt has the cross. And here is some examples right here. Right, just like the beetle in Egypt with the cross, the symbol of life. We give above an illustration of three of these engraved shell gorgets taken from three different mounts. We have selected these three because each figure of the cross is a little different. All right, so you see the different types of cross it has on the back, but just like Egypt having the beetle with the same cross on its back, same thing. Where's the real Tamari? Where's the real Egypt? It would be seen that they are exactly like the symbols figured and described by Shilimon, so common on the wor worlds and other objects dug up at Troy. This is just one of the glyphs here. Just wanted to show you it has the uh, cross, right, with the circle in it. That's one of the uh, symbols in the, the glyph to Mary, to Mary or uh, the people of the land of the Nile flood, the Egyptians, the to Mary ends, to Mary ends, to Mary. We're in chapter uh, 17, it says here, Lord Kingsborough in his Antiquities of Mexico gives illustrations of numbers of crosses found sculptured there, among which are the following. This is some examples right here. Of these, Dr. Ways in his The Obelisk and Freemasonry makes the following remarks. All crosses have more or less symbolic significance. The third of these Mexican ones looks like a cross of a high importance in masonry because it is but a modification of the cross used by the widely diffused order of Ishmael, right? The Ishmael, where did they get that from? You see that? It has been found on the Syrian, Egyptian, Hindu, Trojan, Roman, Mexican, and Peruvian ruins. It has been called the Jaina cross because it is so highly cherished by the Hindu caste named Jains. It is even found on Gothic cathedrals and fortifications of Central Europe so that its esoteric meaning must have been known to the ancient dwellers of the Western continent. It's because they are the ones who originated the symbol. We know what it means. We can tell you the whole story behind it. They can't do that in ancient Egypt. Being a Knight Templar himself, the writer attention has been many times called to resemblance of these cruciforms devices to Masonic emblems and it is indeed strange that there are few Masonic emblems which cannot be reproduced from the symbolic devices of the mound builders of the Mississippi Valley. Not only are these symbolic devices resembling those of Masonry, figured in their hieroglyphics, on the burial vases, on their amulets and other objects, but in the shape of vast earthworks that are numerous throughout our great valley. Forms like those on page 76 are common in Ohio and elsewhere and embankments of earth, which in some instances enclose many acres of ground. The circle, the square, and the triangle were well-known symbolic forms among these ancient people. All right, we're going to see a lot of the mounds, and a lot of the mound walls are built in this same way, with these same shapes, circles, squares, triangles. So beside these symbols, we have seen quite enough during our exploration in the mounds to warn us in believing that many of the religious observances of the mound builders were analogous to Masonic ceremonies. So what are the Masonic, Masonic people really doing? They're doing the ceremonies. Where do they copy that from? Were the mound builders Masons? Of course they're Masons, because what is Masonry? Is building architecture, sacred geometry, right? No, but they were sun worshippers. Oh, now you want to say they're sun worshippers. And this worship has probably the beginning of all religions and the beginning of all society. Masonic archaeologists have reason to believe that masonry is older than the pyramids of Egypt. Of course, it's old, existing perhaps before there were any structures of public character. When they met upon the highest hills and in the lowest valleys and worshipped the sun, the all-seeing eye. Chapter 18 it says here that the Mississippi Valley was once the home of a vast population composed of tribes who had fixed habitations, settled down, right, dwelt in large towns practice agriculture with a good degree of method and skill. They settled down, they created civilizations with what corn, my ease, plenty of it, who had a well-organized system of religious rites and worship and whose aesthetic tastes were far in advance of the savage who roamed over her prairies and hill ranges when her great rivers were first navigated by white men as we are confident, no difficult matter to prove, all right? That's what's going on. 
I'm going to show some examples of these mounds. There's a group of mounds once occupying the site of St. Louis right here. This, this is another shape right here. Mound walls. They were building the mounds. This one right here as well. And look at this one right here. It says the Sacred Pentagon. Where do you think the Pentagon got their design from? The Sacred Pentagon. Look at that. So another one right here. Look at this. Right? Then we got the uh, animal uh, mounds. The animal. This is in Wisconsin. Emblematic mound in Wisconsin. Continuing page 101, it says, All over the world, primitive men have made earthen mounds over their dead. And Homer, describing the burning of the body of Hector and the building of a great mound over the ashes, describes just what was practiced by our American mound builders. Many of the customs of the mound builders were similar to those of the Greeks, and which are traced through them back to the Egyptians. One usually recognizes an Egyptian landscape by seeing in the background a pyramid, and Egypt and the pyramid seem to be inseparable. Yet America has many pyramids, all right? So America has many pyramids. So what is that to say? They are common in Mexico, and some of them rival in size of those of Egypt. All right, we caught already. We're going to see that we have bigger ones. They're bigger than all, taller and bigger in base and, and mass. They are also found in Central and South America, and some of these are faced with stone and have all the peculiarities of the Egyptian structures, even to the singular openings to chambers within. There are many pyramids in the United States, regular perfect pyramids of earth and not faced with stone. One of the largest of these is situated on the level plain of the rich piece of lowland bordering the Mississippi opposite the city of St. Louis and known as the American Bottom. In the midst of this plain, where it's with its 10 to 12 miles, there are still to be seen the remains of a mound builder city that in the majesty and extent of its ruins will view with any in the world. In the center of a great mass of mounds and earthworks, there stands a mighty pyramid whose base covers nearly 16 acres of ground. It is not exactly square, being a parallelogram a little longer north and south than east and west. Some 30 feet above the base on the south side is an apron or terrace on which now grows an orchard of considerable size. This terrace is approached from the plain by a graded roadway 30 feet above this terrace and on the west side is another much smaller on which are now growing some forest trees. The top which contains an acre and a half is divided into two nearly equal parts, the northern part being four or five feet the highest. The height of this structure is about 100 feet from actual measurement. On the north and east south of the structure with the degree of astonishment, not unlike that which is experienced in contemplating the Egyptian pyramids. What a stupendous pile of earth. To heap up such a mass must have required years and a labor of thousands. It stands immediately on the bank of the Cahokia, and on the side next it is covered with lofty trees. Were it not for the regularity and the sign it manifests, the circumstance of it being on alluvial ground and on the other mounds scattered around it, we would scarcely believe it to be the work of human hands. Earthen mounds are common in Egypt, and there is hardly a doubt that their great stone-faced pyramids like those of Mexico were erected for religious purposes and used as tombs for the great or on rare occasions. The Egyptians, like most of the nations of the Old World, began with solar worship. So were the Mexicans, Peruvians, and our own mound builders, worshippers of the sun. After touch the hijack, all right. After many days' exploration and study among the Cahokia mounds, we believe that the evidence tends to prove this group of the greatest mounds on this continent and perhaps in the world had its origin in religious purposes. And quite possibly, this was the Mecca or Grand Central Shrine of the Mound Builders Empire, all right. Here, the longest axis of the Great Cahokia Pyramid is 998 feet. The shortest 721 feet, and it covers 16 acres, two rods, and three perches of ground. The Great Pyramid Cheops in Egypt is 746 feet, so it's smaller, right? It was 900, Cahokia 900. This is only 700. The Aztec Temple Mount of Mexico was 680 feet square, while the Cahokia Pyramid is of much the same shape as the Great Temple Mount, and as those of Egypt, it is very much larger. Cahokia is larger. 
Cahokia and the surrounding mounds much larger and greater in number. More mounds surrounded and more pyramids around it than in Egypt. We are led to believe that here on the bank of the Cahokia, in the center of our union, was the greatest congregation of religious structures ever known, not merely on this continent, but the world here in Cahokia, here next to the Mississippi, all right? The biggest, the largest in the world. What a city, what a population there must have been at that time on this favored spot. Do you remember? This view is also strongly evidenced by the fact that this rich plain, this rich, fertile soil, all right, was the uh, etymology of Kemet, black, rich, fertile soil, rich delta soil. The Mississippi has a rich delta, all right? Same thing, just like the Niles described in ancient Egypt, the Mississippi does the exact same thing, deposits, all right? Rich plain, more than 75 miles long and five to 12 miles wide is, as Brackenridge remarked, three quarters of a century ago, a veritable cemetery of the past and full of the proofs of long occupation. Relics of the Stone Age protrude from the banks of every creek and ravine in the rich fields opposite St. Louis and for miles up the Cahokia Creek we have seen the market gardener literally plowed through human bones. The little labor with which enormous crops are grown here would excite the envy of the plodding planter on the banks of the Nile, patiently waiting for the sometimes tardy flood. You see that? what he just said he said by the time they get there the floods over in the now while they're waiting there's so much growing here crops growing here in the mississippi it would envy anybody on the nile over there in that desert waiting for the the, the flood to come some eminently traveled writer after admitting that nature stands re re revealed on a grand scale in america complains that this new world is wanting antiquity like those so full of interest in the old this writer out to come to Cahokia, he don't know. He's saying this dude, he's saying, oh, they have great nature and everything grows here, but there's not, nothing there. And, but he, then this author saying, well, he should have come to Cahokia then. And standing on our Cheops, whose base covers more ground than any in Egypt. All right, any in Egypt, more ground, bigger than any in Egypt. Look down on the monuments of prehistoric America. When he asks who built them, the echoes of his inquiring voice may go reverberating among the temples below, but the answer will not return. For no one knows, no one knows the dead past is indeed buried as dead. So if nobody knows, then how can anybody make up any conjecture about what they say they are, who they are, how old they are, if nobody knows, right? All right, and I just want to read this part. It's correlated with what I'm about to point out about the uh, so-called Egyptian history, right? Even their own history. So it says here, the question before us, however, is not exactly as to how this continent, they're talking about America, became originally peopled, but more as to how civilization commenced and was disseminated, all right? So we're going to uh, show you that agriculture is the way to create a civilization, help civilizations become. If we knew this, we would have the history of our mound builders. It is a singular fact that most nations have traditions of migrations, even the Egyptians, who have a record of their own civilization longer than that of any other people, perhaps, because they have monuments 4,000 years old that show an advanced civilization, but we're older, right? Even the Egyptians, according to early writers, had traditions of migrations, and singular as it may seem, these traditions would seem to point to some other people from whom they had learned. So the Egyptians learned from somebody, this Lila letting you know here, according to the story of Solon as given by Plato, the Egyptian priests had preserved these traditions of their migrations from another country. All right, they came from somewhere else, the Egyptians. Wilkinson, who had studied this subject thoroughly, says the origin of the Egyptians is enveloped in the same obscurity as most people, but they were undoubtedly from Asia. All right, what Asia? They're from Asia, so they're not African. Huh? The Egyptians are not African, so this whole Pan-African thing is killed right there. Pan-African, they're not even African. And you're going with Egyptians, right? They, he's saying right here, they're undoubtedly from Asia and is proved by the form of their skulls. All right, but even on the Nile, there was an Aboriginal population disposed by the Egyptians. And according to Wilkinson and others, beneath the foundations of the ruins of the Nile are still to be found the root stone implements of the people who lived there before the Egyptians got there. All right, Egyptians are not the oldest people. They have their own story that they came from somewhere else. We're going to see that as we go on today. Right? They call their gods the Westerners. We know Thoth is from Atlantis, so-called America. They're not from there. 
They're not even African. Uh, the book is called The Mound Builders, Their Works and Relics by Stephen D. Pete, Ph.D. It says, member of an antiquarian society, the American Antiquarian Society, American Oriental Society, fellow of American Association of Advanced Sciences, member of Victoria Institute, also of Société de Ethnographie, uh, core member of Numismatic Society of New York, Historical Societies of Virginia, Wisconsin, Rhode Island, Davenport, Academy of Sciences, also editor of American Antiquarian and Oriental Journal. All right, so, uh, you know, this guy don't play. Yeah. America is called the New World, and so it is, for it is newly discovered. Hmm. Our claim, however, is that America is also an old world, all right? It's also not an old world. It is the true old world. It is the old world, not also an old world. Dodge the hijack, ain't nothing over there on that other side old. <laughs> it's recent. And compares well with other countries in this respect. All right, letting you know right away in chapter one, right? The mound builders, right? The guy you saw his credentials, all the societies he's a part of, he's letting you know straight up that yo, don't get it confused. Don't get it confused. America is also an old world and it compares well with other countries. He's talking about Egypt, Babylon, Iraq, all those places. All those places. China. India or Hindustan, right? As it was called. All right, this part of the book, uh, they talk about the discovery or they made uh, in the city of Davenport. All right, so this is the information they had. They say they found several, a uh, large number of relics, uh, seashells, copper axes, pipes, hemisphere, hemispheres of copper, arrowheads, pieces of galena, pieces of pottery, pieces of mica, stone knives, copper implements shaped like a spool, rondelles shown that treponine had been practiced. Many of the axes had been wrapped with coarse cloth, which had been preserved by the copper. All right. The pies are all, all of mound builders' patterns. Some of them were carved with effigies of birds and animals. One bird has eyes of copper, another has eyes of pearl, showing much delicacy of manipulation and skill in carving. All right. This is an art. All right. These relics excited much interest and were put on exhibition before the American Association for the Advancement of Science at Detroit, 1875. All right. They're uh, going around showing your ancestors art, artwork. Right. About uh, 20 copper pipes were reported at that time and 11 copper olives and large number of bones. They were said to have been found at various depths, some of them near skeletons, some near altars, some in ashes, though they were all from the same group of the Cook Farm. The mounds on the Cook Farm were the most of them stratified. All of them contained bodies and ashes. Two or three of them contained altars or round heaps of stone, but with no relics upon the altars. Mound number three was the one in which the tablets were discovered. All right, tablets, writing. This was a low mound, about three feet high and 60 feet in diameter. It was a double mound and contained two graves parallel to each other, three or four feet apart, six feet wide, and nine or 10 feet long. In making the excavation of the first grave, party found near the surface two human skeletons which were modern in indians and with them modern relics such as fire steel a common clay pipe a number of glass beads a silver earring below these was a layer of river shells and a large quantity of ashes which extended two feet below the surface but which rested upon a stratum of earth 12 inches in depth under which was a second bed of shells all right so here's a figure it's going to talk about this later on this is um, the hieroglyphics of one of the tablets, all right? See that? A lot of this like this one looks like Paleo Hebrew, what you call Phoenician, this one too. Well, actually all these right here, some of these, some of this one right here. Continuing, it says the second grave was not opened until the year 1877, about two years after the first. Mr. Gass was attended by a party of seven men, two of whom were students. They found near the surface modern relics, a few glass beads and fragments of a brass ring, also a layer of shells 12 or 15 inches thick. Beneath this second layer, five or six inches thick. Beneath the second layer, a stratum of loose black soil or vegetable mold. You see that? Just sounds like what they did in the Amazon. All right, talking about black soil, Kemet, black rich soil, Kemet, that's what it means, black soil. Where's the real Egypt, all right, or Tameri? All right, loose black soil, vegetable mound, 18 or 20 inches thick, and in the mold fragments of human bones. 
at the bottom they discovered two inscribed tablets all right lying close together on the hard clay five and one half feet below the surface of the mound both were encircled by a single row of limestones about two and one half feet east were a copper axe a few copper beads fragments of pottery a piece of mica and a number of bones these were found at a subsequent exploration not at the same time as the tablets it says the large tablet is 12 inches long from 8 to 10 inch wide and was made of dark coal slate all right that's going to be figure 22 all right this is figure 21 so it says talking about the smaller tablet all right it says then uh so it has three concentric circles, though the signs do not the least resemble the Mexican or the Mayan calendars. The larger tablet containing a picture of either side, one represented a cremation scene, another a hunting scene, a hunting scene. The cremation scene suggests human sacrifice, suggests, he's saying, a number of bodies are represented as lying upon the back and the fire is burning upon the summit of the mound, while the so-called mound builders are gathered in a ring around the mound. All right. So again, it's figure 21. They didn't really explain that. Above the cremation scene is an arch formed by three crescent lines representing the horizon. And in the crescent and above it are hieroglyphic, some of which resemble the common figures and numbers and the various letters of the alphabet. There are 98 figures, 24 in one, 20 in the other, and 54 above the lines. The peculiar features of this picture are these. A rude class of mound builders are practicing human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. One containing a face, the other circles and rays. Above this is the arch of the heavens with Roman numerals and Arabic figures. All right, Roman numerals. All right, what did they find in the Burroughs Cave and in Arizona, right? Where's the real Romans? <laughs> and Arabic figures. All right, we're talking about all these all these languages and glyphs they're finding in this part of the world. All right, the true old world. Remember, he said this is the old world also. Let's see what else he found. The figures eight is repeated three times. The letter O repeated seven times. With these familiar characters are others which resemble letters of the ancient alphabets, either Phoenician or Hebrew. All right. So I wanted to show you this image right here. This is the Davenport tablet. Let me just zoom into it. All right. Maybe zoom out a little bit. All right. So do you see this? You see how they're like, he's saying they're like, doing a ritual right here to see the sun the moon oh, what's going on here luminaries is this the firmament what is this is this what is this? the firmament but you see the glyphs i see i see paleo hebrew i see a lot of things here all right and we saw the maya writing the other day all right with uh the egyptian compared i see that here too they already told you they found arabic uh roman numerals Phoenician and Hebrew, right? All in one. This is in the mounds over there in Davenport. All right, so dodge the hijack. Let me just zoom in a little bit more so you can see that. All right, y'all see some of you, a lot of you are going to recognize these symbols, a lot of you. What is this? Is that the moon and the sun? Is this the firmament? What is this? <laughs>